Hello, everyone. I didn't get my abstract in on time, and I feel really bad about that now. Um, I also gave a bad talk title name. I really didn't want to talk about this. What I want to talk about is serverless side rendering with AWS Lambda React Parcel.js using arc.codes. You're right. Buzzword bingo time. We've got server side, serverless side rendering, Lambda, React, Parcel.js, Rollup, and Arc. OK. Uh, really, this is an elliptical narrative. I'm going to talk about pre-rendering content, uh, mostly with servers, and then I'm going to talk about doing it with Lambdas. Because um, I had a really big question. I started working on this software project a couple of years back, and uh, we decided we were going to go serverless. Uh, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, maybe in hindsight, it wasn't the greatest idea at that time. I would go for it now that NetLify supports it. Um, and we asked, could we do this? Is this, is this actually possible? Uh, so we started to dig into this question. It's rife with a whole lot of FUD. Uh, people used to call this isomorphic rendering, which everyone agreed was a bad idea. And so we started calling it universal rendering, which was also kind of a bad idea. Really, I just call it pre-rendering. We're just we're, we're concatenating strings here, people. We don't have to make it complicated. Um, OK, so uh, why do we do it, and how do we do this thing? Um, mostly we do it because of performance. And so we want good author time performance, uh, obviously, as we're writing our code. We don't want to write two sets of templates. That's a big waste of time. We want good runtime performance. And this usually manifests itself in the fact that you can render the page before you've actually loaded your JavaScript, parsed it, and then uh, re-rendered the page. And this helps with perceived performance, so the time to first byte, time versus, or time to interactive, or terms that we're, we're coming to terms with. To me, these are the best reasons. Some, some devices just don't support JavaScript. E-readers don't support JavaScript. Low-end phones don't support JavaScript. Screen readers don't support JavaScript. And if we're going to do this, we should probably be doing this because of accessibility, if there's any reason, um, which tends to be the last reason anyone gives. But it should be our first, most important concern. OK, so uh, Parcel.js. Anybody here using Parcel at all? I can't even see you, so I don't know. I'm going to say nobody is. Because is anybody? Really? No one here is using Parcel? Who's using Webpack? <laughs> yeah, OK. All right, you'll catch up. Um, that's not even that funny. I mean, they all do the same thing. They just concatenate strings. OK, so uh, this is an entry file. You're used to this type of thing. Uh, you've seen this all before. I, I'm sorry if you can't read in the back. It, maybe all oh, it worked. Um, the thing I wanted to point out here, in React 16, uh, we got this idea where we can rehydrate an application from pre-rendered content. This is a really powerful idea, and React just made this super slick and simple. This is exactly the same as React DOM.render. So there's not much to learn there. So this is one weird trick uh, for making this happen. You want to have a function that you can run on the server where you pass its state and it returns you a string. It's basically the whole trick. Uh, for server-side rendering. Usually this gets ignored because it's rife with complexity. And I'll zoom in a bit because I used Carbon for this because uh, Reveal.js didn't make it easy. So um, what you want to do is you have like a document where you're going to render your application in, and you want to put that state into, into that document. And you want to even encode that state in the document also so the client can pick up that that window.initial state and rehydrate your client with that same state. That's basically the whole trick. And I have source code for this, but I only have 15 minutes, so I'm going to roll through it and I'll share the code with you. But I'm just going to explain it at a high level so you get the idea. So uh, JSX needs to be transpiled. This isn't news. You all know this. Um, you probably want to limit that transpile time. You probably don't want to transpile your entire back end just because you're using templates. And this is why you want to put this in a single function. If your back end is you know, a gigantic express app, compiling that thing just because you have JSX in it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It, it'll take a ton of time. If you put this in one single function, you can reuse it everywhere, and it'll, it'll be easier, and you don't have to fight the transpiler with the Node.js runtime. Another benefit is it makes your code, your front end code, portable to any runtime. And this is what most interested me, because I wanted to run this thing inside a Lambda, which is pretty much exactly nothing like a server. So in the server side, we would see something like this normally, where we would grab like a reference to our application render function, and then we would call it with a little bit of state, and then we'd poop that out on the other side, and we'd ostensibly have a, have a web page. I want to point out that this is super cringeworthy, and I don't like this example, because star route has happened exactly no times on a production application ever. 
Um, you're going to have routes that are not a part of your React app, and that's totally OK, and that's normal. Every app like tutorial on server-side rendering has always got this express server with star routes, and it makes me cringe every time I see it. So I wanted to point out that I was doing the thing I hate. So it's what we do. Um, so then the big question is, you know, what happens when all these servers go away? Uh, we're measuring billing now in milliseconds. We're not measuring it anymore in uptime, and uh, that's a super big deal. Um, provisioning is now measured in minutes, not in hours, and by provisioning I mean like setting up our infrastructure. Deployments are now measured in seconds. They're not measured in minutes or hours. We can deploy pretty big apps and close to real time. Um, faster provisioning and faster deploys means quicker time to market or less lead time to production. And this is usually considered a competitive advantage. And so this isn't something that you can necessarily opt out of. The world's going this way, and this is, this is what's going to happen. So there's three vendors worth mentioning. Um, and there's one I like, and that's, that's Netlify. Um, <laughs> But these are the ones worth mentioning. So there's, there's Lambda, they're ahead by many years, um, and then there's other guys that do stuff too. <laughs> um, <laughs> and this is just power laws. I'm not you know, pumping Amazon's tires because I like them necessarily. I do shop at Whole Foods and have an Amazon card and basically give them all my money. Um, <laughs> but but it, I mean, they, they are winning, and um, that's kind of how it goes. And, this is, this is normal. This happens in technology all the time. It happens roughly every 10 years. And this isn't any discussion about lock-in anymore. This is broad, broad adoption. And if you're adopting Amazon, then you're de-risking. If you're not, yikes. Um, so Werner Vogel, the CTO of Amazon, has this great statement I really love. Primitives over frameworks. And the idea of primitives over frameworks, they design their products to sit on top um, sit on top of the conceptual ideas that you would normally have about how to build something. And that allows their customers to come in and start building things that they wouldn't have expected. And so when you think about an application, they almost always have all these things. These things aren't really unique. Amazon just names them really fucking weird. And <laughs> so they're all there, though. These are all the same things. These are just like weird names for all those things. Um, and when you start to think about primitives versus frameworks, you start to think more holistically about what these solutions have to offer. The Lambda has gone a little bit farther than I think anyone expected. It's also become the glue between all their services. And so this is now not necessarily something you can totally opt out of. And once you get in there, it just starts like sucking you in more. Um, from a high level, we call this functions as a service. The idea is that we're focusing on our application logic. We're not focusing on like maintaining infra or OS upgrades or any of that other junk. Uh, which maybe you've had to do. The bigger win to me is that you get this crazy isolation. And so when we built our app on top of this stuff, uh, we had a security bug that was pretty bad. And uh, one of our investors found it, which was really bad. And <laughs> our CEO did the thing CEOs do. He panicked and screamed at me. And <laughs> it's like, we got to take this thing down. I was like, we're going to take it down. We're taking it down right now. And, I realized that we had you know, over 40 Lambda functions. And I actually had no good way to take it down. This was the first time this occurred in my entire 20-year career in this industry. I couldn't take my shit down the best I could try. Normally, I would, every, I would take it down by default. Um, but now, <laughs> now I've got the opposite problem. And so this is, this is interesting. This is like a, a resiliency effect of having these single, isolated, tiny little units of compute that you deploy that scale independently. And that's, that's pretty important. And this is nice. You know, we launched the other day, and we got crunched, and it was exciting. And uh, we didn't go down. It was actually pretty boring. Um, and that's never happened to me before, either. So um, I'd like to take a moment uh, of silence. I don't have time for that. But um, servers did good. The server thing was nice. We learned some good lessons. Um, it's time to move on. But the main thing that we learned that I really like is the idea of infrastructure as code. And if you've heard of this concept before, the idea is that you check in a manifest file to your repo that describes the way your infrastructure works. And now your infrastructure will be versioned alongside your application logic. And this is a powerful concept. There used to be some tools that did that that I don't care about anymore. There's new tools. Um, SAM is from Amazon, stands for Serverless Application Repository. Serverless with a capital S and a TM means the company, um, not the, the broad term. And if David Wells is here, I'm sorry, but I had to call it out. Um, Terraform's from HashiCorp. They have an idea. 
And then I worked on one called JSF Architect, and so I'm deeply biased. I'm going to tell you about it. I'm not telling you to use it. I'm just going to tell you about it. We call it ARC, um, and we donate it to the JavaScript Foundation because we believe in open governance as a basis for open source. Touchy subject around React people. Um, <laughs> leave, it, leave it at that. We'll leave it at that. Uh, so ARC came from the idea of RC files. Uh, if you're used to Unix, you've seen RC files everywhere, vimrc, bashrc, that kind of thing. And it stands for Amazon Run Commands. Um, ARC uh, solves the problem of YAML and JSON, in that YAML and JSON are horrible. Um, and ARC also uses NPM scripts. It doesn't use global CLI tools. It's also super fast. It's tuned for a high-level developer experience. Um, we extracted it from begin.com, so it wasn't like I sat down and built a framework, and then I'm pitching you on a framework. I built begin.com and launched a product, and we extracted uh, a framework from that, which is a pretty big difference. So there's three things you want to know. Uh, ARC has three rules. So comments start with a pound, sections start with an at, everything else becomes infrastructure. That's it. Yeah. OK. So this is an ARC file. And this would define three Lambda functions. Uh, a get slash, a post likes, and a get likes. And they'll all be namespaced hello. That's it. And if we look at the code, we ripped off Express un unabashedly. We said request response next is a good pattern. Let's steal it. Uh, Request.send in a synchronous interface does not make sense, so let's not steal that. So we took a functional sort of style keyed interface. Um, and that was about it. A few other things to know. It deploys to staging and production. NPM start works locally, so it works offline. Session state's enabled by default. It's deliberately super terse and doesn't do a whole lot. So let's talk about the actual problem I was trying to solve. Um, so Lambda functions are stateless. They don't know anything. Um, and they get thrown away all the time. And so you can't depend on having state inside of those things. But what you want to do if you're going to render your HTML is you have to pass it the state and then return that string. But we solved that problem a little bit earlier. So I built a Lambda function that did just that. And I npm installed React and React DOM into my Lambda function. And I thought, this is going to work great. It did not work great. So React and React DOM by themselves, even with production enabled, installs 10 megabytes of code. Now, Lambda functions don't like being big. If they're over five megabytes, you will not have a five, or you won't have a sub-second cold start. If you're under five megabytes, you're in luck. You will have a sub-second cold start. Um, and that's just how it works. You know, I don't really have a horse in this race about why it works that way, it just does. So we couldn't do this. You know, we couldn't have a three, four second cold start for an app for a performance reason to make it faster. It just didn't make sense. So the next time, I was like, well, maybe we can compile our entire app into a single function, and then we'll see how big that is, and we'll call it. And it worked. It just worked. Um, worked beautifully. So we built our client side with Parcel, um, which, seriously, you should try it out. It's kind of amazing. It works super well. Um, and we built the back end side with RollUpJS using a simple node client, and that was kind of it. Both of them inha inherited the same stuff from Babel RC, which I thought was nice. It was one of those moments when configuration just worked. And I was like, wait a second, is this actually doing what I think it's doing? Because it looks like it worked. And it did. So the conclusion is that this is absolutely possible. You can do this if you want to. Um, all the code is on GitHub. And I actually even have one minute for a demo. So I'm going to show you really quick. This thing is from this repo which this talk is based on. I would have dug in if I had more than 15 minutes, I promise you. Uh, all I can do is log in. You know, there's not, it's not going to show much. It's going to log in. Oh. <laughs> there it goes. OK, so it logged in, great. This is using React and client side and whatever. No one really cares. <laughs> I mean, whatever. Like, no one cares. So right here, disable JavaScript. I mean, this is the real test, right? And we log out. Ooh, same UI, same experience. The only actual measurable difference is that it's faster. 
<laughs> so I'm not really sure how I feel about that, but um, yeah, all the work is open. Uh, this is a thing, and uh, thank you very much.